I'm Jimmy Cook from University of Missouri, and today we're going to do an update on the canine unicompartmental elbow arthroplasty system, or the Q. And what we want to focus on today is kind of the practical application of it. So what dog should we do this in? You know, what's the current status of research in the area? And then also we want to talk a little bit about case recruitment. And so what we've done is we put together a video here at Arthrex for the general practitioner. We've kind of gone over elbow diagnosis and what stage each treatment option uh, could be employed at. And so hopefully that will help you in terms of recruiting these patients that we know are out there and that are not getting the chance for optimal management. Really talked about that in terms of all the way from elbow arthroscopy in the young patient through non-surgical management, including things like joint injections, and then all the way up to Q. And so that's what we want to kind of pull in today and give you the information that you need then to follow up on that and help them decide about the referral and the treatment options. So I'd encourage you to direct your general practitioners to that video as an informational aid to also help you in that process. And that's available on the Arthrex Vet Systems website. In terms of disclosure, uh, I am on the patent for Q, and I do receive royalties associated with that. So this is the Q, the canine unicompartmental elbow arthroplasty system. And again, it is the medial compartment resurfacing where we have the humeral component and the ulnar component. And we've developed this to address medial compartment disease in the dog, which so commonly occurs. And our goal is pretty lofty. So actually for Q, we're looking for relieving pain, of course, but we're really looking at restoring full function and really in high level performance dogs. So this is one of our early patients who's about three years out now, and this is Lincoln. And you can see that Lincoln six months after Q is very functional as a pet, but he's also a search and rescue dog. And after being literally non-weight bearing lame, after the Q replacement, he's gone back to full search and rescue function, and then just enjoying out in the yard as well with his clients. And that's really the goal. We're interested in that level of function in a very safe and repeatable way. So the research and development of Q has been published. Uh, this vet veterinary surgery article uh, that Sam Franklin, Kurt Schultz, Josh Carnes, and I uh, put together really tells you the whole process. And I'll be frank, I'm really proud of this process. And I appreciate the way that Arthrex brings these things to market. So I do think we've shown well the safety of development, how and why it was developed, and really should give you a lot of confidence in terms of the, the quality of this product and the work that's gone into it to make sure you can really apply this well to your patients and help your clients out in that way. Briefly, the principles are that it's unicompartmental because that's what we really see. And I've been impressed in looking at these cases, even 13, 14-year-old dogs, the disease process really stays unicompartmental. It does stay on the medial side. And so I think this is applicable in actually more cases than I thought it would be from the start. It's bone sparing. It maintains the normal stabilizers of the elbow, which I think is critical. You don't have to dislocate the joint to put it in. No cement involved. And then really the alignment changes and kinematic factors that we and others have published on um, don't come into play in terms of a negative way for using Q. Um, again, part of the research was we showed that it is um, in contact through the stance phase range of motion, and it really is simple and safe. And I think uh, most surgeons, once they take the laboratory, really enjoy putting it in and feel comfortable that it's repeatable. The implants here, there's a cobalt chrome CP titanium bone ingrowth surface or the biosync on the humeral component, which has amazing ingrowth capabilities. And I'm actually really proud to say that we've had zero loosening in uh, well over a couple hundred cases now. The ulnar implant right now is completely ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. It's uh, both our press fit systems, but we are moving then to a bony ingrowth ulna that will be a running change as well soon. So both of those components will have this excellent in-growth surface on them to allow long-term stability of the implants. Uh, there are two sizes right now, the medium and the large, and that really fits well the range of dolls that we're looking at. So we've typically done from us in the smallest range of Cocker Spaniel up to the giant breeds, and um, you know we'll address more sizes as needed with that. One thing I also love is that it's all one kit. The instrumentation is very simple, very elegantly designed, and uh, very high quality. And so it's easy for your technicians, it's easy for you to know what to use and how to use it, 
in a very consistent way. And it's a, a really nice, elegant system in, in terms of that. There are two approaches, and uh, as I'll relay in a minute, the um, research shows that either is definitely acceptable. And one thing that we've always designed into this system is bailouts for each step of the way. So that's also the beauty of both approaches. The tenotomy, as shown here, with anchor fixation, or the osteotomy of the medial epicondyle, shown here, with screw fixation. Again, both are associated with very good outcomes. And it can be up to the surgeon to use uh, whichever they like. I do definitely suggest that you know how to do both because certainly the tenotomy fixation can be a bailout if there's a problem with the osteotomy. I, I typically say that the um, osteotomy does have just some technical advantages and maybe some advantages for early healing. But again, both are definitely acceptable. And so that's something you can choose in terms of your practice setting and your level of comfort. The research and, and development of this has been extensive, and through second look arthroscopy, follow-up radiographs, and even histology on some of our samples, we've really shown that this is an effective system in terms of ingrowth. And so all of those measures of outcomes have uh, shown the safety and efficacy of this device, and I really think we have done this in detail, so again, you can be confident with it. Through this process, then, we've developed a bunch of keys for implant placement. These are in the technique guide, in the video, and this is certainly something we go into detail with during the training course. And so that's something that you'd want to do, and we have a good number and breadth of uh, resource materials for you to make sure that you get these and so that you can do them well. But suffice it to say for this presentation that we've really um, kind of teased out all the critical factors and really made those available for you in your instructional materials. So after all of that, we brought it into clinical use and we really did not do that until we had you know, really tested this fully and so I feel comfortable with it. And then once we were comfortable with especially the safety and repeatability of it, then we went ahead and introduced it into clinical use. And we did that in a multi-center prospective case series. These, patient, these clients uh, all had informed consent for their patients to undergo this. And for this one, we really um, enrolled dogs that had medial compartment disease, so cartilage loss of the humeral condyle and the medial uh, coronoid process with clinical signs. And really, all these dogs had failed previous treatment. And what we mean by that is they all certainly had had many attempts at non-surgical treatment. So the cases you're all thinking about, the ones that we see every day, um, that really then there's nothing else and the medical management's not working anymore and we need something else. And that's really where Q fits in. And many of them had also had arthroscopy, joint injections, and other attempts at trying to manage these patients. And then you can see the assessments that we did pre-operatively and post-operatively. So to cut to the chase, to give you the evidence for employing this in your practice and for educating clients and your general practitioners about this, is this what we saw. We actually did 103 consecutive cases. I think it's important to point out here that these were the first cases of Q done. So these were not after the learning curve. These were not, you know, once we've dialed everything in, these were the first 103 from 17 surgeons across the world from 15 different centers. So you can see the patient demographics there. It's, again, exactly what you're picturing in your mind for something that you need an answer for. And that's the middle-aged dog, typically medium to large to giant breeds. Um, labs, Golden German Shepherds are the most common that we see. Another really important point about these data are that in this series, 73% of our cases were working or performance dogs. So we're really going at the highest level and highest expectations for outcome. And so I think that really frames um, the good outcomes that we saw and shows you that this really is a device that's accomplishing the goal of reaching full level of function afterwards. And then our mean follow-up was 10 months, but we had from six months, which was the minimum, to be included in it, all the way up to now four years. And you can see then the distribution between tenotomy and osteotomy. So when we uh, look at the outcomes, so this is the, the, the system of evaluating outcomes that we publish in a consensus statement in the article in veterinary surgery that um, orthopedic surgeons have agreed to for these subjective outcome, long-term outcome measures. 
And when we look at those um, outcomes, we see that in these 103 cases, uh, we had full and acceptable levels in uh, 47 and 43 percent. So those were all then success. Those were all patients that definitively improved after Q and went back to function that we would like to see. And so when we combine those together as a definition of success, then we see a 91 percent success rate. The complications are listed there in terms of percentages, and we did see those across categories. In 61 percent, we had no complications, and in 27 percent, we had just minor complications. We're going to tease out the catastrophic and major complications here in the next slide. But I do then want to point out, especially on this slide, that in those percentages that were performance and working dogs, we saw this really same level of success. So almost 90% of performance or working dogs returned to the intended function of pre-injury or pre-problem in the elbow joint. So I think that's really important. Again, as I mentioned, there were no, when we compared all of these between tenotomy and osteotomy approaches, we saw no differences in the outcomes, both in terms of success and complications. So again, we can do that uh, either approach uh, appropriately. Then for the cases at our site at University of Missouri, those were 26 of these cases, and in those we did then ex additional objective measures. So we did lameness grading in a blinded fashion, and then we did kinetics. So we did uh, the gate four force mat system to look at those in objective. And what you'll see here is that we saw statistically significant improvements in lameness grade and percent body weight, weight distribution, or force on the force mat, so weight bearing in the affected limb. And this is really, I think, significant because it goes from a very uh, lame level of only 20% weight bearing on the limb, or about a grade three lameness on average, all the way up to then almost normal weight bearing on the limb in the 28, 29% area, and nearly imperceptible lameness in those situations. I think it's important to point out that this was at six months afterwards, and that's one big critical client, client communication point with Q is it's not a quick fix. It does absolutely take the six months of recovery, healing, and rehab to get back to those highly successful levels that we're talking about. So please know that, and please indicate that to your clients and even your general practitioners, that this is still a joint resurfacing replacement procedure, and it does take time to get to those levels, but we should see success at that point. In terms of complications, to tease those out a little bit more, um, the catastrophic complication was actually at the owner's request in a, a situation where um, we unfortunately didn't get any follow-up, but it was an owner decision. When we look at major complications, most of those are technical um, with either the osteotomy or the implant malpositioning, and again, why it's important to have the tenotomy as a potential bailout. We did see three cases of infection, but fortunately, those were all extra-articular. So, so far we have not seen uh, implants infected, and again, we have not seen implants loosened in those situations. The minor complications um, were managed with uh, um, non-surgical treatment, so we were able to resolve those over time uh, pretty readily and pretty easily. So you can see just the distribution of those and what you could expect and how to potentially troubleshoot those as well. Really critical point uh, to discuss preoperatively is the post-operative management. And so obviously analgesics, we also do use antibiotics for about 10 days orally. And then it's absolutely mandatory that we do soft padded bandage for at least two weeks with a change at about one week. We've really seen that this is necessary to ensure comfort and to minimize complications, especially with the tenotomy or osteotomy. And then really we wanna just go on the restricted side of management for the early time period. So for the first eight weeks, it absolutely should be just leash walking and confinement for sure. And then if everything's looking good at that time point, we can start to build them up. Really start them back into training about the 12 week mark if they're a performance or working dog. And then about again at six months is when we can really say full release, they can go back to everything that they wanna do. When we do all this, when we really stick to the plan and apply it appropriately, we see great outcomes. This is one of my favorite patients to talk about. This is Lincoln. And Lincoln was, as I mentioned before, a search and rescue dog, um, very high level search and rescue dog that was removed from the program because he had uh, periods of even non-weight bearing lameness. 
and uh, the service that he works for actually had to remove him from the program, which made his handlers very disappointed. We were able to get him back to function. He actually worked in Moore, Oklahoma, um, on the recovery process there. And I think you can see in these pictures just the amazing um, results that we can get, especially if you look at range of motion and then also weight bearing. So this was the leg we put Q in. Please do notice this was seven months postoperatively, though. So it's important to remember the time frame when we think about this all the way through. But we can see some pretty remarkable results um, when all parts of the process are done well. So what, where does that bring us? Where does Q really fit in? What do I need to do to put this into my practice? Well, I think, the, again, the GP education, we believe, is a big factor. We've got to somehow capture these cases that need Q that are not responding to medical management, and the owners and your general practitioners are looking for something else. We really think that's where Q can fit in well. And so that educational process is really important, and hopefully we're giving you some more tools for that uh, in terms of the video. But this is for medial compartment disease. So again, this is you know where we have definitive arthritis in the medial compartment with clinical signs. But we know that's a lot, a lot of patients. And really, I think the spectrum, the typical progression, and what you're going to look for is, if possible, we do want to do arthroscopy on these dolls when they're young. Certainly a lot of controversy about that in terms of medical management versus arthroscopy. But I do think if you can get to them early, that the data and, and our experience would show that fragment removal and taking care of that early on is really important. The good thing is, is that does still leave us the option of Q on down the line then for sure we're going to manage these patients for years. Um, you know, with weight management, with rehab, with body condition um, scoring, with trying to keep these patients in the best shape as possible, and certainly with medications. And, and we do expect that they will go through the process of non-steroidals and then maybe adding a gabapentin or a tramadol or whatever else you want to add in, the nutraceuticals, and then probably progress to a point of joint injection. So, you know, we published a study that shows that ACP is very effective in terms of intraarticular management of these patients, so that can be a next stage. And then when that's really failing, so that's when we talk about uh, failed management, then that's when, again, I think we should have the opportunity to reach for Q, and that it can be a really good uh, a potential treatment option at that stage of disease that can even get us back to full function in working in performance dogs. So not just an, an option of, of exclusion, or not just uh, a salvage option, but really a high level return to work, return to a quality of life option for our patients. And I think that's really especially true because we have shown it to be very safe and effective in these patients when done appropriately. The only other one we may add to that, and I think this is still a question on the table, is what about the young dog with humeral condylar OCD and a medial coronoid process fragmentation or fissuring or disease? Because we know that those patients don't do well with traditional management. So I have done those in the younger patients. That's really, for me, the only indication in the younger patient. Unfortunately, in just a few cases, it has been very successful, and I would say anecdotally and very subjectively that it is better than debridement or any of the other options that we have available for those severe cases. So that's another one you would have in your mind about a consideration uh, when we see that preoperatively or during the scope, the severe changes on the humeral condyle on that young dog, we can potentially resurface those with Q and get some uh, better long-term outcomes than we're used to getting with those cases. So hopefully that's provided you with some information and some practical application of Q, where it might fit in. Um, the next really step for you interested in Q, if you haven't already done so, would be to take one of the training courses. So Arthrex Vet Systems offers training labs in Q, and those are really necessary to get Q going in your practice. But then you certainly can uh, start to apply this in your spectrum of treatments for this really common and really problematic disease, which is the medial compartment disease in our canine uh, patients.